Uh-oh. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of people there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, you know, we're, we're, we're oh. sort of far away, but I feel pretty close because there's all these people here. And uh, luckily, we're pretty close to the ta same time zone. This is a mic check. Hello, thank you. Ms. Williams, can you hear us? We've got you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll try, I'll try to speak slowly. I'm aware we are talking across a continent. What time is it there? It's uh, just six o'clock, or I'm sorry, five o'clock here, 5 p.m. Okay, good morning to you then, because it's 6.30 in the evening here. <laughs> well, okay. luckily, um, I'm in Russia, and it's uh, just 5 p.m., so we're, we're actually pretty close. Yeah, we, we are. A few opening remarks, with your permission, because we have 3,000 students here, and a lot of dignitaries, so I will do the necessary courtesies. Good evening, everyone. This is a historic afternoon. It is made possible thanks to the untiring efforts of two institutions, the GRD College of Science and the Consulate General of the United States of America. The U.S. Consulate General has committed itself to a fabulous Experience America program that is proving to be a path-breaking collection of interactions, exhibitions, and experiences. We're deeply grateful to them for this gesture of cooperation to our institution, and we want to acknowledge all the efforts of not just the Consulate General, but also of the country of the United States of America. The GRT College of Science owes its genesis to one of India's greatest educators, Dr. Damodaran, his son, Dr. Padmanabhan, his wife, Mrs. Geeta Padmanabhan, who is the secretary of the college, and who are the architects of the naturally acclaimed institution that GRD has become. The GRD institutions all put together account for close to 3,000 students, are alumni now spread all across the world. Face to face, on which Ms. Williams is now appearing, is one of our college's most accomplished, celebrated, enduring programs. We have had over 150 luminaries visit, and the most far-reaching one being as it is, is this one, as it is being webcast by the United States Consulate General all over the world. One more reason that makes this day extremely special to all of us here is for the first time in Tamil Nadu, for the first time in Coimbatore, and to the best of our knowledge for the first time in India, GRD introduces a revolutionary new state-of-the-art teaching tool, the EduSalt from Global Technologies. This is not just a pad or an iPad. It is a customized hardware and software tool. It is unique to GRD SCIB and begins a new chapter in the educational accomplishment of this institute. As a thrilling demonstration, Ms. Sunita Williams will be appearing on the iPad. I wonder if you can see us, ma'am. You are also being tracked on 20 EduSalt pads that students of the college are now holding in their hands. We are hoping this is a stunning demonstration of the technology that will be extended to all of GRD students in a few days. I now invite Dr. Krishna Kumar Ramachandran, Director, to open the curtain on an extraordinary face-to-face. -face. NASA is here, Sunita Williams is here. I don't know whether Houston is connected. Ms. Williams, can you see all the students holding up your your picture on the EduSalt pad. Smile, ma'am. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, here's Dr. Krishna Kumar Ramachandran, director of the institute, to welcome Ms. Sunita Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, respected officers of the Consulate of the United States of America, Team GRD, members of media and special invitees. It is an honor and privilege to welcome you all 
to this historic occasion. <clears throat> we have frequently heard exceptional women being out of the world, being described as out of the world for the first and probably the only time in your life you will meet a woman who really, honestly, truly is out of this world. She is an astronaut. She, she is an astronaut and not just any astronaut. She is an extremely accomplished one. At this moment, she is between missions at the International Space Station, which is why she is in Moscow, from where journeys to and from the ISS take place. Ms. Sunita William has the highest amount of the time spent in space among any astronaut on Earth and the highest number of spacewalks among any lady astronaut. One more thing, like all women who are out of this world, she has the most expensive wardrobe on Earth. Each of her space suits costs millions of dollars and is a biosphere to all to itself. And she, is, she has Indian ancestry as her dad and his four people hail from Gujarat. So she is in so many ways one of us. GRD College, Coimbatore, India and the US Consulate General of Chennai welcome Ms. Sunita William for this historic event. Welcome on board, Ms. Sunita Williams. It's my pleasure to now invite Corina Ybarra Arnold, who is Acting Public Affairs Officer, Cultural Affairs Officer, and Public Affairs Section of the Consulate General of the United States of America. Corina. Vanakam, Kobai. Vanakam, Sunita. I'm so excited. I just said hello to Sunita Williams. That's so awesome. Um, Ms. Williams, thank you so much for talking to the students today. Uh, the consulate in, in Chennai is here in Coimbatore executing an event, a, a, a multifaceted event called Experience America, which showcases the best of the U.S. I hope you can see us because there are about 2,500 students here from all over the city of Coimbatore. We could not think of a finer person to address the students as you, as you are a role model, especially for young women who dream about breaking barriers and making a difference. All of us have been really looking forward to this interaction for a really long time. Thank you for working with the U.S. Consulate General in Chennai to make this face-to-face -face really special. For the students, please join us at Codicia tomorrow and Friday to learn more about the U.S. and also join us on our Facebook website because when you connect with us, we can stay connected to you. Nandri. Ms. Williams, we are done with our courtesies and 3,000 students are waiting to hear you speak. When, take as long as you want and when you're done, we'll open the floor for questions. Over to you, Ms. Williams. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, to everyone who has put together this program. It's uh, quite an honor to be here, and uh, it's a little bit, um, I think, intimidating when I, I look at the size of the audience. Um, I'm excited to be part of your program, and I'm excited to be talking to the students. Um, you guys are the future. And uh, what we're doing in the space program, hoping, hope, hopefully, will be opening doors for you to uh, continue on and go to bigger and better places that we have gone to already. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and I appreciate all the wonderful uh, introductions. Thank you very much. I have been extremely fortunate to have uh, had an opportunity to fly in space in uh, 2006 and 2007, which took me to the International Space Station. And there I was part of the crew that uh, put part put part of the space, space, space station together, which meant that we were able to do uh, some spacewalks and use robotic, use the robotic arm to install uh, parts of the space station. Um, 
And now, uh, after that, I, uh, I have the opportunity to, uh, again, go back up again. And this will be a little bit different, because last time I rode on a United, Space, United States space shuttle, and uh, this time I'll be flying up on a uh, Russian Soyuz rocket, uh, which means that there's a lot of training uh, here in Russia, as well as our other international partners who are participating in the International Space Station, uh, Canada, Japan, um, uh, Europe, Europe, so we ha we're traveling all over the place uh, to, to train to go to the International Space Station. Uh, I'm hoping that in the future we're going to do something even bigger than that. We're going to go beyond low Earth orbit and we'll be joining with lots of other countries, uh, hopefully India, and uh, we'll be joined in with uh, all the, our partners I mentioned already and, and more. Uh, and we'll be leaving the planet not as people from a certain country, but as people from the planet Earth. So I, I'm excited for you guys. You're the age that uh, is going to make that happen. So um, I'm, I'm excited to hopefully pave the road just a little bit for, for you all. Um, another thing that was mentioned today that I just want to reflect on is uh, my, my childhood and growing up. My dad, of course, I think you know, is Indian. He's from Gujarat. He grew up in Gujarat. He went to medical school in Gujarat. And then he came to the United States. Uh, he met my mother in the United States, who's an American, so I'm half American and half Indian. Uh, so we had the luxury of growing up in a household which had lots of spicy food uh, from India. My uh, favorite, of course, I think you probably know, are samosas. And, uh, of course, uh, glob joms and jalebis were our close second. Um, and there, there was a comment about clothes. Well, yeah, I do have sometimes an expensive wardrobe from space, and I have also imported some Indian outfits as well and uh, have, have, have some nice Indian uh, outfits that I like to wear at home. So I would say just from the travel from India to the United States, they're, they're pretty expensive as well, but they're beautiful. So I, I appreciate that. I, um, I, I have very, I very much liked that I had a, a, a family that had multicultural uh, influence in it. it. I think it is one of the most important things uh, that I learned when I was growing up is really to be accepting of others from different cultures. Um, when I grew up in Massachusetts, we were really the only, in my small town of Needham, Massachusetts, we were probably the only Indian uh, family. And uh, people always knew us from our last name, which is Pandya, and uh, of course our, our first names, which are somewhat Indian, Sunita. Uh, like you know, so it was interesting. They always identified us as the Indian family, and it was uh, it was pretty much of an honor uh, to be part of that that group. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about uh, also the upcoming mission. Uh, I'm so happy that we got to interact at this point in time because time is getting close for us. We're my crew is uh, again an international crew. I've got a Russian Soyuz commander um, and a Japanese uh, gentleman who's the uh, flight engineer on the Soyuz. And then on the space station, I'll be the, I'll be the uh, space station commander again, along with my uh, Russian counterpart, Yuri Malenchenko, and Japanese counterpart, Aki Hoshidi. We'll be joining another crew up there that is uh, another couple Russians, uh, Gennady Padalka, Sergei Revin, and Joe Akaba. So there'll be six of us when we arrive in July. I, I hope you're all going to be watching. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting, the launch from Kazakhstan. Uh, and uh, it will be fun to be up there for the next uh, six months. Um, and that will be a, a mission that's quite different from our first mission. The first mission, like I said, was part of the building of the International Space Station. But this mission will be primarily a science mission, as well as a test bed for new vehicles. We're having some vehicles, commercial vehicles, come to the space station probably for the first time, and we'll be grabbing them with the robotic arm and installing them onto the space station to supply, uh, to resupply the space station with parts and pieces and food and clothes, and I'm hoping there'll be some samosas in there for me. Um, uh, other things that we'll be doing up there, we'll probably, hopefully, be doing a spacewalk. We have, you know, the space station is like a, uh, a house, and every now and then, Something breaks and something goes wrong, so we have to fix it. So there's a couple pieces outside uh, that just need a little bit repair in some, at some point in time. And so hopefully we'll be going outside and, as we call it, outside on a spacewalk to uh, repair those parts. Uh, so it should be six months filled with, a lot, again, a lot of robotics, some spacewalks, 
uh, some installation in a lot of science experiments. Uh, the space station is a national world laboratory. It, we have laboratories from the United States, of course, Russia, Japan, uh, the Europeans, and a bunch of, then a, a whole lot of experiments from countries all over the world. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm sure that there are some Indian experiments up there, and I hope that there will be some more in the future. Um, with that, that's just a little bit of an introduction. Can I uh, open up the floor to questions or answers or uh, any, any specific topics folks would like to talk about? Can you hear me? Excellent. Thank you for that conversation with us, Ms. Williams. Can you hear us clearly? Now I can. When I was talking, I, I couldn't hear anything, but now I can hear you clearly. Yes. Excellent. Uh, we're hoping the clarity stays true for the next 40 minutes. Here's the first question for you, which seemed to be the most popular question. You're the very first Indian on Earth to walk in space. How does walking in space feel like? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, there's probably not a better feeling uh, in and out of this world. <laughs> Just to be short, real short and concise with it, but seriously, the space station and the space shuttle have windows where you can look out of um, but it's like you are someplace where you're looking out a window of a house. Um, when you're in a spacesuit and you are outside, it's like you actually were able to go outside of that window in the house and look around and walk around. And you can see, like, potentially, like, the beautiful trees and the beautiful lake that you can only p see through your window. But you're actually outside. And to put it in real life, in real perspective from the space point of view... You can look down, out into the atmosphere, uh, deep into the galaxy. I think one of the most impressive feelings was that space is actually 3D. It's not just black with a bunch of stars like you look at. It's actually 3D, and you can feel how it's just going on forever and ever. That's if you look out towards space. And then if you look down toward our planet, um, the first time I saw our planet in daylight was about 20 minutes into my first spacewalk, and I wasn't nervous beforehand uh, going, going and working out on the space station, but as soon as the sun came up and you could see the planet going by so fast, I got a little bit nervous, and I hung on to the space station pretty tightly just to make sure I wasn't going to fall. And then I had to convince myself, hey, you're not going to fall. You're floating in space. It's okay. But it was uh, pretty impressive uh, to see our planet below you. And one of the most impressive things about our planet that I saw on my very first spacewalk was uh, the northern lights. And if you've ever seen them, they're uh, green lights, usually up in, like in Alaska, for example, in the United States, you can see these things hitting the planet. But they were below us, and it was northern lights hitting the, the planet from below, which really made you feel like, wow, there is a whole lot of energy in the universe that we probably don't know much about and we have a lot more to invent and uh, find out and figure out and explore and uh, there's there's just so much more to do uh, for us in the space uh, industry and I hope um, there'll be people in this audience who will be investigating that. Excellent, thank you very much. Now for questions from the students, are you ready? Second question, quick. Hello ma'am. It's an honor to be speaking to you right now and my question to you would be on your very first flight to space what were your thoughts at lip floor ma'am was that clear to you absolutely um what were what were my impressions at liftoff uh liftoff is amazing and you can't even describe uh liftoff because you don't know what it, it's like especially on your very first space flight you know you've you've been there before i've been there at kennedy watching my friends launch before in the space shuttle and it makes me nervous. You can feel it, you can hear it, but we're generally about three miles away. But when you're sitting on top of that rocket, it's, it's pretty impressive. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. we can. It's, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first of all, um, when you come up to the rocket before you get in, 
uh, you're at the bottom. You're where the engines are. And the rocket's pretty tall. And you're looking up above and you see this humongous rocket and you can feel it for the first time like it's alive because they filled it with cry cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen. And so it's breathing. It, fe it feels like the whole thing is moving and shaking just there on the launch pad. That's even before you get in. And then you ride up a ladder, or an elevator rather, to get into the, the vehicle. And when you get in the vehicle, this is something we actually practice in a trainer at Houston or here in Star City. And it feels pretty normal because you practice always in a simulator. That felt fine. But then you're sitting there for a couple hours in your spacesuit, getting ready for the launch to happen. And to be honest with you, I never thought it was really going to happen. Um, then all of a sudden, uh, at a couple minutes, five minutes before launch on the shuttle, the uh, APUs, which are the auxiliary power uh, units, start up. And that actually moves some flight control surfaces. Now remember, we're at the very top of the rocket. Those flight control surfaces are way at the bottom. And so you can actually feel the vehicle start to move around. And then six seconds before launch, the main engines start up. And the whole vehicle is shaking and rattling and, and uh, groaning. And it also moves back a little bit. And you can feel that in your seat. And then at liftoff, the uh, rockets, the solid rocket boosters light off. And you feel like you're propelled into, into the sky. And you're pushed back a little bit. Now, you know, it only takes eight minutes to get to space, but the first minute and a half is pretty loud and rumbling because of the solid rocket boosters. On the Soyuz, I think that's going to be a little bit different because it's a liquid system, and so it's just like liquid gas in your car, so there's not any air bubbles like there were in the solid rocket boosters. But uh, from the shuttle launch, it was exhilarating. It was like a roller coaster, but it was like a roller coaster that you knew uh, was, was going. There was no turning back. There was no getting off it. You're on your way to space. And uh, right at eight minutes when the engines shut down, everything becomes quiet. And the funny thing is also at that point in time, um, things that you that are unconscious, you realize that you're actually in zero gravity, your arms start to float. As soon as you take off a glove, your glove floats away. As soon as you undo your helmet, your helmet starts floating away. And so you really know that you're actually in space. It's just an incredible experience. And I think um, nobody, was, nobody was sad. Nobody was scared. Nobody was nervous. Everybody was excited and uh, just really uh, excited for the ride. It's a, just an amazing, amazing ride up to space. Thank you, ma'am. Question number three. Who's next? Yes. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Ma'am, could you please tell us something about uh, the stringent astronaut selection process at NASA? Ah, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I think everybody who's in the astronaut office really believes and, and sort of knows that we're, we're all sort of lucky because there are a lot of people out there who are very um, talented and, uh, and, and really well deserving of becoming an astronaut. Um, I think when I applied, there was about 3,000 people who applied. I think the, the latest application um, go-around process was about 6,000 applicants. So there are a lot of people out there who are very talented uh, who are applying. And so it's a pretty difficult process for the group who's selecting. Um, the class of 2009, I was actually part of the selection process myself, so I have a little bit of insight. Um, some of the things that we're looking for in, in people, for sure, are, of course, their educational background. You know, I'm a, I'm a pilot. I'm a helicopter pilot. Uh, I was a test pilot for a while, and that's, that's one criteria. But we also have uh, doctors and physicists and chemists and engineers. Uh, of course, we actually even have a veterinarian in the, in the uh, astronaut office, too. So any of those fields which are uh, technical, um, uh, math and science is very important in the background. And then folks who are somewhat adventurous, uh, folks who have leadership qualities, 
You know, it's a small group of people that are going to be riding in a Soyuz, for example, three people. Um, and there's only going to be about six people living on the space station at one point in time. If we send missions to, uh, you know, back to the moon or onto Mars, there'll probably be about three or four people. So we're looking for people who are, work well in small groups of people as, as leaders and as followers. And, uh, and also, of course, there's um, medical criteria. I say medical because folks always say, don't you have to be in really good shape? Well, you have to be in pretty good shape because there's a lot of uh, physical things that they ask us to do, like to do spacewalk training, is in a pool with a suit that weighs about 300 pounds. Um, not that you have to pick that up because you are in the pool in the, in the water. Uh, you do have to go out and do uh, sort of camping like winter survival and water survival just in case your space, you know, to practice if your spacecraft has a problem and lands in some unplanned area. So there are some stringent things, but the medical criteria is pretty strong because you want to make sure that you're healthy on space, in space. Remember, sometimes when we're up in the space station, we're our own doctors. Um, there's no, there might not be a doctor up there. So uh, hopefully, one, we're all healthy, and two, we uh, learn a little bit of how to take care of each other up there. So the selection process looks at all of that criteria, the basic criteria, uh, being a, some, having some piloting skills or some flying skills or understanding uh, mechanical things because pieces and parts, like I said, break and you need to be able to use tools and put them back together and fix them. Uh, that's all, uh, those are all parts of the, the whole, what we call the package that we're looking at of people when they're coming to uh, apply. And then, um, that's just the, the paper part. Then the other part is an actual interview. We bring folks to uh, Johnson Space Center, and we have an interview, a physical interview process, as well as they go through a medical test. And then they have some, um, uh, what do you call, like leadership, followership tasks type of uh, games together to see how people interact with each other. Because, of course, you're in a small, what, you call, what we sometimes call a small can, for about six months, so you have to be able to live with each other pretty well for, for that period of time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Question number five. Ready? Hello, ma'am. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Fine, ma'am. My question is, who was your biggest support and who was your biggest inspiration, ma'am? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, well, I, have, I do have a little surprise for you all today. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, you can talk to people when you're up in space. We actually have a phone, and we can call back to people at home and say hello, so I could say hi to my parents, of course, and my brother and sister. But one, um, one thing that I couldn't really talk to was probably uh, one of my best friends. Let me show you real quick. Hold on. Uh. <laughs> Corby, who's there? Look at look at everybody. See everybody on the screen? <laughs> so that's this is Gorby. He's uh he's my uh Jack Russell Terrier, my my dog. Uh, yeah, yep. And um you you asked what are your some of your biggest supports? Well, I I'll go back to the family and friends. Um my sister and my mom were especially good about taking pictures of my little buddy here and sending him up to me because he, he, they knew I couldn't really talk to him and I was very curious about how he was doing and, and what was going on back on, on Earth with, with him. Um, I, would, I actually wrote home journals every week about what we were doing in space and my, uh, my mom and my, uh, my sister and my dad and my brother, actually all of them participated in writing stories, made up stories about what Gorby was doing back on Earth and sent them back up to me as, as sort of a, a support. So, of course, I missed Gorby, but I knew he was in, in good hands uh, on Earth. And, uh, and this time I actually got the, the, the privilege of bringing him to Russia with me for the, for the first time. And he had his picture taken, his official picture in his, with me in, his in my spacesuit. So that was sort of fun. <laughs> Okay, next question. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Ma Hello. My question <laughs> is, I, 
my question is was becoming an astronaut a very early idea in your heart did you head towards exactly for that at your earlier stage um a very interesting question because there are a lot of astronauts who from very beginning like when they're five years old they saw some something on television maybe read something or met somebody and they've always wanted to be an astronaut and for me honestly that wasn't the case um, you know I my family uh, had really not a engineering background like I said my dad went to medical school in India and was a doctor in the US um, and so there wasn't a lot of exposure directly in my family to engineers uh, of course we all did took math and science and somehow my brother and my sister they were very good at math and science and they're older than me so I had to be good at math and science too you know how you have the same teachers in school and you have to be good because they're expecting you to be as smart as your brother and sister so we were all pretty good at math and science and that just sort of opened the door for me for engineering and I really actually liked it and went to a, uh, a college which specialized in engineering um, I didn't really know what engineering was either. I didn't really know how that applied uh, to being an astronaut at all, honestly, to be totally honest. But I, from the Navy, I started flying airplanes. And one thing that I loved about flying airplanes was learning how to fix them and actually how they operate. And that has everything to do with being an astronaut. I didn't know it at the time, but that is exactly what test spacecraft are. They're like test planes, and it's how they work, how they're put together, how they're designed, and that's all engineering. And so, honestly, I didn't know or think about being an astronaut until I was a test pilot, so I was about 26 years old. And then um, I had the opportunity to go to Johnson Space Center. At that point in time, we met um, John Young. I don't know if folks in the audience know who he is. He's actually been to the moon a couple times. Um, he was the first guy to fly the space shuttle. Pretty amazing guy. And he talked about landing on the moon and talked about, alluded to uh, the characteristics of helicopters to landing vertically on the moon. And that was the first time in my mind that I thought, wow, I'm a helicopter pilot, then maybe I could land on the moon one day. And so maybe I'll apply for this program. Um, so that's, that was the very first time I started thinking about it. And I tell you this story because um, a lot of you might not know what you want to do right now, and that's okay. Uh, find something that you really enjoy. I love flying. I love working on airplanes. And then somehow you become really good at it because you enjoy it, and so you concentrate on it. So if you guys find what you like to do, if you like math, if you like science, uh, follow through on that. If you like arts, follow through on that because you'll, you'll probably be really good at something that you like. So keep that in mind. Excellent. Next question. Hello, ma'am. What do you think that uh, running on the Boston Marathon from the ISS? <laughs> well, what that was sort of a crazy... I'm, I'm sorry? What, what led you run the Boston Marathon from the ISS? Um, this was sort of a crazy idea, <laughs> and I, I will still uh, say it's a crazy idea today, but it was, it was pretty neat. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I really like to do, my sister and I ran a lot while our running partners, we run together quite a bit, and uh, we grew up outside of Boston, and we used to always see the Boston Marathon run by, close by our house, and support it. Um, when I was getting ready to go to college, I ran the Boston Marathon for the first time as what we used we called a bandit because I didn't really have a number and I just jumped in and, and did it uh, because I thought, wow, I don't know if I'll ever have the chance to do this again. I'm moving away from my parents. Um, and when I was getting ready to launch on the space station, uh, I had run a marathon and I qualified so I wouldn't be a bandit. However, I was going to be gone because our launch was in December and the marathon is in April. So I said to my sister, hey, I qualified. Is there any way that um, you can get a number or I can get a number with my qualifying time? And sort of as a, as a joke, she, she called the director and got us numbers. Now, in, in all honesty, I, uh, I had an idea in the back of my head that I thought it would be a good idea because uh, 
I think physical fitness is really important. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the medical qualifications for being an astronaut. Well, you're going to be fine medically if you live a pretty active lifestyle and you keep pretty healthy. And I think kids today need to uh, just keep that in mind that um, having an active lifestyle, being healthy, eating right, exercising is really is re really a way of life. And it's, it's something that actually as astronauts we do all the time. You have to work out uh, two hours a day or so on the space station just to maintain your uh, cardiovascular health as well as your bone density. Do you know in space your bones start to deteriorate just because you don't use them? You're not standing and your, your hips start to go away, your feet start to go, your ankle bones start to go away. And so to supplement that or to prevent that from happening, we have to get on the treadmill and lift weights up there. So it, it's something we do all the time. You get used to it on the ground. You are healthy on the ground, which will allow you to actually get a space flight, which will allow you to fly in space, which means you have to work out more while you're in space. <laughs> so, so it was sort of um, a, a thing to help promote the idea of even astronauts uh, have to work out, and, uh, and it's actually a really nice thing to do. Honestly, in space, it's a stress relief. You, you're working all the time. You're, you know, you're up in an environment that at any time, you know, hopefully not a, you know, a meter, a micrometer, I could hit the vehicle. So you're always thinking about what the next thing to do is. And it's nice to actually get on the treadmill and just go run for a little while. Um, I would say four hours and 20 minutes is not relaxing. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I'll do that again. But I hopefully will do some fun thing for the Olympics, which is coming up this summer. If you guys have any good ideas about sporting events that we could do, I would love to hear. I would love to get some feedback from you. We were thinking about some type of space flying relay, but if you guys could think of something that we can do in space, uh, let us know. Excellent. Next question. Quick. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is, what is a normal working day at the ISS like? Oh, interesting question. You know, we try to keep, um, we have control centers, I'll just start it this way, all over the world. So, you know, you're uh, in India right now, the time is a lot different from the United States. Likewise, in Russia, it's a lot different from the United States, as well as Japan. And so we try to keep the crews on a normal work day, but how do you do that, right? Uh, the spacecraft goes around the planet 16 times in one 24-hour cycle. So you're seeing sunrises and sunsets all the time also. So this adds a lot of co uh, complication and confusion. We try to keep us on Greenwich Mean Time, GMT, as much as possible. Uh, we try to keep it a uh, like an eight-hour work day with, on either side, there's time for exercise and there's time for eating, and then about eight hours of, of sleeping time at night. Um, and that we try to do that. We're able to do that uh, without worrying about the sunrise and sunset because we all have sleep stations, and so we can go into your own little sleep station where you can close the door where it's quiet and it's dark and you're in a sleeping bag. And so you can sort of get away from everybody for a little while. The windows all have shutters, so you can close the shutters to make the space station darker. Uh, so we try to all try to get a good night rest sleep up there. However, um, things happen. Other things happen, like other vehicles come to visit. And orbital mechanics, orbital mechanics dictate sometimes that uh, a vehicle might be arrive at 3 in the morning. And so we have to do this thing we call the sleep shift which is changing our sleep pattern. It's just like flying, you know, like from the United States to India. All of a sudden, you're a little bit tired, so you've got to sleep in the next day to get acclimated. So that's what we do when we sleep shift to uh, intercept different vehicles that are coming up uh, to the space station. So we try to keep it as normal of a day as possible, um, but that doesn't always work out too good. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Hello, ma'am. What was the biggest sacrifice you had to make? Wow. Um, I think missing my dog was one big sacrifice, that's for sure. Um, but the second sacrifice, what I really missed when I, when I, when I was up there, when I came back, was uh, not having to take a shower. There's no showers up on the space station. <laughs> So, so when I came back, I was really excited to sit 
and feel water falling down on me. Um, while we're up there, we take like a, a sponge bath well, just with a towel and some soap. We actually have what they call no-rinse shampoo, so you can put shampoo in your hair and put a little water in it to move it around and stuff. But it's, um, it doesn't, you, de- you never feel like you really have had a really nice shower. So um, when I came back, one of the things I asked was when, when we go back to the moon, because it does have some gravity, I hope we can design a... Uh, a, some type of shower that will work with moon gravity. <laughs> a shower is a really nice thing to have after a while. Um, hold on. Ma'am, we have a couple of questions that have come in online from the worldwide webcast of your current streaming conversation. So we'd have Corinne ask them to you at this point of time. These are online Absolutely. questions and your answers are visible on the web. The question is, hi Sunita, does the burgeoning trend of space debris creation threaten space activities? How far are we from adhering to the maintenance of outer space as the common heritage of mankind? That's a hard one, sorry. Yeah, I, I, that is a little bit of a difficult question. Um, I'm trying to uh, formulate a, a concise answer. Um, I think the first part was about space debris. Uh, is that correct? The other question had to do with your physical training, but you've already answered that. And uh, what are the numbers of hours you put in every day during your astronaut training? Okay, well, let, let me just go back to the very beginning question. I think part of it was about space debris. And yeah, absolutely, there is space debris uh, in the area where we're flying. Um, you know, our vehicles are pretty str- you know, strengthened on the outside uh, and uh, fortified, so we don't necessarily worry about it on a everyday basis and actually there's a group of people on the ground who are tracking anything that's about a, about a uh, softball baseball size uh, to move the space station in case we ha- we encounter something that size that would be pretty catastrophic and so we're able to move the space station with a what we call a reboost uh, or actually move its change its attitude so that we'll avoid anything like that. However, you know, when we're out on spacewalks, we do see evidence that micrometeorites, small micrometeorites, have hit the space station. We see little um, divots where these things have made uh, indents on some of the metal that's out there. So, yeah, of course, there is, it is an area where we have to worry about, um, and that's why our spacesuits are so uh, built so strongly and with so many layers as well. Um, the other question you mentioned was physical exercise. Yeah, that, that does take up a, a little bit of time, and we're trying to get better at that. Part of one of the experiments is actually doing a more uh, intense physical fitness protocol to maybe decrease the amount of time that we have to work, work out in space because we, what we'd like to do is actually do more science experiments up there. And if we're on our way back to the moon or on, on to Mars, um, you know, we're going to have to build smaller equipment to work out on. Right now we have a treadmill. We have a resistive exercise device, which is pretty big. It's about the size of a table. Um, and all that stuff has to get smaller to fit in a spacecraft that's going to go on longer dur- missions, or we're going to have to figure out a different way beside for exercise to maintain our, our physical health. Um, and the third question is about what's the day like for, as an astronaut. Um, that is a, good, a great question. I never feel like I'm at work. It's pretty amazing. Uh, one day we might do a simulation in the Soyuz spacecraft that we're on a launch and we have some emergency and we have to uh, figure out how to maintain that. The next day we might be practicing for a spacewalk in, the, in our big pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. The next day we might be taking a class, learning about some science experiment that we're going to be doing up in space, talking to the investigator, the, probably the world-renowned investigator in that area of science. Uh, the next day we might be in this, uh, the space station uh, simulator, um, planning, working out a whole day of how we would actually do work on the space station and maybe doing some maintenance tasks where we might have to uh, 
change out a uh, like a CO2 cartridge or the oxygen generation system. So every day it's pretty varied. Um, right now we're about six months, you know, we're in the six months time before launch. And so our tasks specifically for when we'll be up there are becoming defined, very defined, like our spacewalk, for example, the robotic stuff that we're, we're planning on doing. And so those we, we actually practice a couple more times, uh, probably once a week or once a month at least, to make sure all those, those tasks, are, we're all ready to go for that. But I tell you, every day on the space station is different. Every day during training is different. Um, it's an exciting and fun job, and uh, like I said, it, it doesn't really feel like a job most of the time. It feels like um, you're working together with good friends uh, from all over the world. And not to mention, there's a lot of language training as well. Uh, I think everybody there has a little bit of a step up because everyone uh, in India knows a couple languages from my experience it, there. Um, it's pretty incredible how, how talented everybody is at speaking different languages and that's one of the criteria uh, for flying on the International Space Station of course because it's a multi-language uh, vehicle. So uh, you guys definitely have a step up. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you uh, on the space station in the future. Hello, ma'am. How do you keep uh, track of day and night on the ISS? It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> Sometimes you can uh, forget about day and night just because we have really good lights on the space station and we're uh, able to... Uh, work whatever time. Um, but we do have windows as well, and the window shutters are generally open, and so you can get the feeling like a shadow is coming across the window when it starts to become nighttime. And I think that's a pretty special time. Um, you know, I used to love it when it was daytime so I could look out the window and take pictures because you can see parts of the world and you can fig you, know, you know where they are, obviously, because of land masses, because of mountains, uh, because of colors in the ocean. You can figure all that out. But actually, at, by the end of my mission, I thought one of the really spectacular things was looking at the world when it was nighttime, and you can see that different countries use different types of lights. The, I mean, the colors of the lights are even different. The patterns of where the people live and how people live and how they create cities is, um, is different, and you can see all that at night. And my big impression from when I was uh, leaving was if I was ever to go to another planet I would like to take an orbit at night uh, so I could see where potentially lights are if that the beings there use lights because there are places on earth that I thought no nah, there's no way anybody could live there but at night you'd see lights and so you know somebody is there so my impression is when you go to another planet make sure you take an orbit in the daytime and in the nighttime <laughs> Next question. Is your microphone live? Come here. Come here. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is, how often do you get to talk to your people at home from ISS? Um, actually, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Usually we have um, what we call KU, which is a type of... Uh, uh, antenna that we have, uh, KU coverage, uh, probably 45 minutes out every hour and a half, out of every orbit or so. And so during that time, it's pretty neat. We actually have a green light on the computer that comes up and it says, hey, you can call at this point in time. Now, of course, everybody is sort of busy, so you don't always get a, get a chance to call. Um, so it's, it's pretty convenient and it's gotten, of course, better uh, over the years. Uh, one of the things that we're going to try uh, an experiment on while we're up in space this time, though, is actually not having communication. Because, you know, as we leave the planet, as we go farther and farther uh, from low Earth orbit, there will be bigger gaps of uh, lack of communication. Right now, it's only about a second and a half or so from the space station through Houston uh, to, you know, a phone wherever around the world. Um, but if we start going out to, you know, to Mars, we're going to potentially get a 20-minute uh, lapse in communication. And so we're going to practice that on the space station, that see how people can work with, 
you, so you can't an ask a question right away. You can't call home right away and to see how that's go going to work. Um, that's going to help us build a smarter spacecraft. It's going to help us uh, get people used to living like that because right now we have the luxury of calling home quite often if we want to. One more question. One more. Hello, ma'am. Uh, my question to you is, uh, will you apply to be a part of uh, the mission to Mars? First of all, I'll just say quickly, absolutely. But you know, there was a there was a little boy who asked me that question, and I'm wondering, are you the same little boy? It was uh, probably about five years ago. <laughs> but the question that that little boy had asked me was, um, would you go if it was a one-way trip? And I thought that was pretty profound. Um, if we, if we, first of all, if we had the technology to go to Mars and come back safely, absolutely. Can you imagine what our planet would look like as you're getting farther and farther and farther away and it starts to just look like a star like Mars looks like to us today? That would just be incredible. And then the ride home, which would be even more awesome, would be to see that star growing and growing and growing into our planet. I mean, that would just be spectacular. Not to mention, um, I think putting humans on Mars would be the, the next step after robots because robots, you know, once, once they find something interesting, a whole bunch of people on the ground have to figure out what they found and figure out how the next move would be to have the robot do the next thing. Where a human on Mars can make that decision right away and we could find out stuff a lot quicker. And with the human eye, we can actually make some judgment calls about whether or not this is important or not important. So yeah, I would definitely go to Mars. Now to answer the second question, would I go if it was a one-way trip? I would definitely go if it was going to help uh, humankind here on Earth. It was going to help us figure out how we can uh, more smartly uh, use our planet and live on our planet and live together on our planet. Then I think I would definitely go. But uh, I, I think we'd have to t do a little convincing to get people to sign up for that. <laughs> Okay, ma'am, we have a tradition here at this particular uh, format of question answer that we ask the guest five rapid fire questions towards the uh -oh. end of every interview. So are you ready for five very quick questions? Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, the first question, what comes to your mind when you think of India? Colors, absolutely marvelous colors all together. Question number two, how do you relax? Uh, I go for a walk in the woods or a walk on the beach. Wow, okay. Question number three, you have many <laughs> recreational interests including running, swimming, biking, triathlons, windsurfing, snowboarding, bow, bow hunting. Running you have already accomplished alongside the Boston Marathon on the International Space Station. Which is the next of your activities that you're going to do? <laughs> uh oh. Um, I I think we'll try and swim, but I'm not sure that's going to work so well up in space. <laughs> but we'll see. Maybe a um, maybe a relay race. Not bad. Okay. Question number five. Do you ever get bored? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> People will ask that question all the time about being up in space, like oh, you're, you're up there for a long time. But there's so much to do. There's so much to look out the window. Uh, you, don't, you, you never live in microgravity here on Earth. So, I mean, you, even cleaning the space station is fun because you can flip around upside down. And it's, it's just, it's a magical place. You know, you can sleep upside down. It's, you never get bored. There's always something fun to do. It's fun to watch food. It's fun to watch water turns into spheres. It's fun to look at somebody's face through that sphere because it's upside down, because it's curved. You know, there's so many amazing things to do in space that you could never get bored up there. And I, I don't generally get bored here on the planet either, though. <laughs> okay, next question. Have you ever changed your mind about anything important when you were upside down in space? <laughs> oh, do you have that question to everybody? <laughs> or just me? Um, 
Actually, you'll, I'll say this. Your perspective changes, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yes, to answer your question quickly, it's, I'll say yes. Because, you know, now I look, walk into a room and I, you know, it's usually 2D, two-dimensional. People stand on the floor, the books are here, the decks are here. But since I've been up in space and been able to use the 3D room of space, I walk into a room and I think, wow, that would be sort of cool if I could float up on that ceiling right now. We're not using that space. It would be pretty cool if you could actually put your desk, you know, on the side wall and not have everything on the floor. And so it absolutely changes your perspective. And in a bigger scope, um, it really has changed my perspective about the planet. It's um, a pretty unique place that we live. And like I'm sure you've heard before, there really are no borders in spa from space. You can't see borders between uh, countries. And you have an interesting time thinking, how could anybody on this planet be fighting with each other? Because we're all on the same beautiful place. You know, it's just, it's just definitely changes your perspective about um, human beings and living here peacefully with each other. Okay, one last question for the students here. What was it like talking to us and your experience with our college for the last hour by video link? Was it a little bit like talking to Houston from the International Space Station? <laughs> yes, and luckily I didn't have to say we have a problem, right? <laughs> So we have, we've had, uh, I've had an awesome time talking to everybody here. The audience is great. Like I said, uh, from the TV, I see so many people. I feel like I'm part of the room, and uh, I feel very welcome and at home. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for, one, inviting me, and, two, uh, letting me talk so much. I hope it, I hope it, was, uh, it was interesting for everybody. It's been really uh, encouraging in... in um, a little intimidating, I'll have to say, uh, and uh, I'm pre pretty humble that so many folks came out to uh, come and, and talk with me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're very kind. I invite Ms. Jennifer McIntyre, Consul General of the Consulate of the United States of America, to propose a vote of thanks to the fabulous astronaut Sunita Williams. I think she's already here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams, you have a couple thousand people here who have been hanging on your every word. And we would be delighted to hear you speak at any time, but I think it's even more special that it's the night before Women's History Month, which as you know in the U.S. is celebrated during the month of March, and you are making history every day. I think you also show the best of our links between the United States and India, and you are an inspiration to both of our countries. We all thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, and I think all of us, when we look up in the skies over the next couple months, will think about you up there. So thank you for being with us. The U.S. The US Consulate would also like to thank our partner, Dr. K.K. Ramachandran, Vice Principal and Director of GRD School, and also the student volunteers of GRD School. Without you, this wouldn't have been possible. So I thank you, Sunita Williams, and I thank you to GRD. Ms. Williams, this is our vote of thanks. I want to start by saying thank you for taking time from your schedule to speak to us. You're a fantastic lady. You're an absolutely fantastic lady. Every inch of your success is well deserved and you wear it so well. So thank you from all of us at GRD for having taken time and coming out to speak to us. And thank you very much for the opportunity. We promise to wave when you fly by the next time. <laughs> and I promise I'll wave back too. <laughs> we look for that. I, I uh, want to take this occasion to thank Sunita Williams all over again. She turned out to be fantastic and exhilarating and exciting to speak to. I want to thank NASA, the National Aeronautical and Space Administration of the United States for making this episode of Digital Diplomacy possible. I want to thank the entire team from the consulate 
General of the United States of America. From all of us at GRD to all of you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. and Mrs. Padmanabhan, whose uh, care and blessing and affection for us makes this possible. The technical support crew here, the technical support crew at Moscow, at NASA. Say thank you to all of them for us, please. Uh, I want to say Absolutely. thank you to all the technical people who work to pull off this miracle of video streaming, especially Global Space Technology for the EduSalt tab that we will now be using, each one of you at GRD. I want to thank all the members of the media who came here and made this evening possible. And above all, I want to thank the faculty and students. But once again, thank you, Ms. Williams. You're fantastic. Thank you so much. Houston, we love you. <laughs> and India, we love you too. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Can, can, we, can we all say goodbye to Gorby too? Is he still there? <laughs> Certainly, one moment. Come here. One moment, we have one more goodbye to say. Woohoo! <laughs> star. The star please, of the show. Please tell him this wonderful wow, bow wow. We love him. Gorby, can you do it? Say, speak, where's the squirrel? Where's the squirrel? Where's the squirrel? Would he like to hear a few <laughs> words for us to witness? <laughs> I'm not sure he Thank will you talk. Very much. <laughs> Good, lovely. Where's the squirrel? Bye bye. Where's the squirrel? <laughs> where's the squirrel? <laughs> Thank you again. Would you would you give him another bone this evening for, on behalf of all of us? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> He's a good sport. Uh, would he prefer a spicy bone from Coimbatore? We could FedEx him one this evening. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, he grew up with some Indian food too, so he knows spicy food for sure. Lovely. Excellent. Excellent.